Hi, welcome everyone. Um, really nice to see lots of you here. I hope um, you had a good night and uh, a good day yesterday. So um, I'm Kate. I'm from the Farming and Land Use team at the Soil Association. And um, we're here to talk to you this morning um, about leveling, leveling up, I guess, um, leveling up the productivity across a whole farm holding and what kind of practices that you can do and what kind of changes and improvements in your systems that you can make in order to make sure that every field on your holding is really delivering the best that it can because obviously depending on soil type topography management history you know each field is going to have a different level of productivity but there's different activity that we can do to try and bring the soil back and do all sorts of um, activity to improve biodiversity that is going to improve production overall and so we've got three farmers this morning who've been working with us as part of the Innovative Farmers Programme, um, who've all been trialling and testing uh, different methods and practices that have been trying to sort of improve the production of, of different fields um, across their holding. And so we're going to hear about that in a minute. Um, just very briefly, ooh, got the wrong slide up. So. Um, but um, those of you who aren't uh, familiar with the Innovative Farmers Programme, we've been going for 10 years now. It's basically uh, a network of uh, farmers who are testing and trialling different practices and different ideas across their farm holdings. So through these um, sort of trial groups called field labs, we enable farmers and researchers to come together and um, there's a funding pot of up to £10,000. And so if farmers have got particular questions or problems or just things that they've been doing that they want to put a bit more science to or um, different activity that they know a group of them that have been doing and that they could really gain more if they came together and did a bit more of a structured trial, um, the Innovative Farmers Programme enables them to get together, bring a coordinator in, bring research um, input in, as I say, access to some money to help with testing or some kit or take some risk out of the trial and, and be able to, um, you know, test and investigate something over a period of time. And, and the three farmers that we're talking to today, um, they've been involved in, in different field labs like this. So if you have got, you know, ideas, thoughts, different things that you've been doing on your farm that you've been interested in taking to another level with a trial or getting together with another group and seeing what they're doing, then uh, please do um, come and talk to us at, at the Innovative Farmers Stand at the Soil Association tent or come and see us afterwards. One of the big things with, um, with IF is also enabling us to sort of really share the learning and knowledge as quickly as possible from these field lab trials. So um, throughout the network, there's all sorts of uh, newsletters and social media and getting out into wider press and the like. So we can really get this kind of raw learning out there as fast as possible. So if you're not part of the Innovative Farmers Network and you'd like to receive the newsletter, I think there's a sign-up sheet going around. And equally, you'll find um, the new uh, report, um, uh, sort of field guide that we've produced recently with lots of, of the trials in there and uh, ideas cards on your chairs to enable you to, you know, any field lab ideas that you've got then then yeah, do write them down, give them to us, and we can see what we can do to, to make it happen. So um, I'll get on, I'll get on with the farmers. So what we're gonna do is the um, each of the farmers are gonna uh, talk a little bit about what they've been doing on their farm, and then we'll open it up for discussion and questions so that you can, you know, and also if you've got any, uh, you know, things that you want to share about what you've been doing, then please do take the opportunity. But, um, but I'll do a brief introduction first, and then um, they'll obviously talk in more detail about what they've been doing. So um, to start with, we're going to have Dan, Dan Gammon. And um, Dan is a qualified vet and uh, was in practice and then headed out to New Zealand for a while and was doing um, a whole lot of dairy farming and working with dairy farm businesses out there. And then returned back to the UK in 2016 and has been in a, uh, the last four years in a share farming agreement in Dorset, milking 700 organic cows in two dairies and uh, managed across over 1,500 acres. And Dan's been working on a trial about sort of looking at extended rest periods for, um, for grass growth and how that can improve soil health. 
um, particularly soil biology. And uh, we're working with another group of dairy farmers. And I don't know if anyone might have caught Tom yesterday, Tom Gregory and Debbie, they were, they're involved in the trial as well. And then we've got Frances. So um, Frances Stanton, and she's a tenant farmer on a 300-acre mixed farm up in North Yorkshire, uh, where they're growing uh, winter wheat and producing high-quality grass-fed lamb. And uh, they've been working to rebuild soil health, do all sorts of lovely activity to increase biodiversity on their farm over the last six years. And one of the key things that they've been doing is have these flower-rich um, field margins, and the field lab that they're involved in is basically looking at how these flower-rich margins can really increase beneficial insects to help then, you know, uh, protect crops and provide pollination. So she'll be talking to you about that. And then lastly, we have David, David Clark, who um, is farming up in Leicestershire on a 154 hectare partnership with his wife and son. And they um, have 154 milking cows and also a herd of Robney breeding sheep and uh, uh, make uh, handmade raw milk goat's cheese and um, basically have been on a, an amazing sort of regenerative practice principle journey for quite some time, which I'm sure he'll be able to share with you. But they're involved in uh, a, well more of a kind of wider uh, research project that we've been involved in, which is funded through Innovate UK called Pastoral. And that is basically using satellite data and uh, modelling to be able to uh, estimate the dry matter production uh, across a field and then being able to use that data to help with pasture management. And um, the team from Pastoral are here and they also have a stand, so you'll be able to talk to um, them more if you're um, interested more in what David's got to say about Pastoral. So um, so I will um, stop there and pass over to Dan. Kate's done a bit of an introduction. Um, you sort of got the background there but basically I'm, I'm quite new into to dairy farming um, learning as we go along and uh, really I excited to get um, more involved in looking at soil biology and that's why we've sort of got involved with this um, this trial um, certainly not my um, I wasn't involved with um, the instigation of the idea that uh, someone in the corner over here can uh, take the credit for that uh, so Tom Tom Gregory uh, sort of pulled together uh, a group of interested farmers and um, and in terms of the legwork on the farm uh, Matt my herdsman who's um, uh, in the audience here has actually been doing most of the fence moving and um, has been really engaged with the with the project so that's um yeah that's uh, a good um, you know ha having having him on board and engaged has been really helpful to to do the extra extra work um, so We've covered most of this. We're we're block carving. We run a we run a spring um, a spring block and an autumn block on two neighbouring farms. The the trial that we're doing is on the on the autumn block. This is a picture of my daughter. And um, so w whilst we've been doing the the trial, we're sort of also trying to combat. Um, we're in a really low uh, rainfall area, and we're on quite shallow free draining soils. And so the biggest limitation to our um, our uh, stocking density and milk production really is how much homegrown forage we can we can grow, and um, I'm I'm sort of trying to increase the diversity across the farm. Um, the the trial has been really good at giving me the confidence to move away from a typical sort of 2,800 entry level cover, um, typical New Zealand style grazing, and uh, and then and you know eating that down to 1500 cover stripping everything bare being as efficient as we can at harvesting all of the the, the grass that we're growing um, to actually thinking more about uh, how can we retain moisture and um, and and then uh, protect those soils really and and then uh, get a quicker regrowth when we get these dry dry periods so this is uh, this is a picture before and after grazing um, a herbal lay with our spring carvers this um, this year uh, I'm I'm pretty pleased with the job they did uh, doing that. The, uh, the the my daughter in the in the picture there turned six yesterday, um, uh, so she's sort of you know about this high. There's some pretty pretty uh, good biomass uh, grown in that field that we've then harvested um, in a in a time when we are very dry on the farm. So we're we're now in our second second year of the trial, and the initial part of the trial 
we there were six of us came together and we spent a lot of time discussing what is tall grass grazing um, and I think in the first year we got it wrong um, for dairy cows we were trying to do the traditional mob grazing that you can see sort of out there with you know really high um, high covers trying to trample those and that that for us that affected our milk um, you know we, we 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 went too hard too quickly I think what I've would have learned since we've been you know been here and we're we're taking a much more nuanced approach to it i think so we're we're trying to our main aim is to maximize the amount of photosynthesis we can do on the on the farm um so that i heard i heard the same message yesterday several times we want to be we want to be um maximizing the the solar panel there so that we can feed the soil biology and um <coughs> and then another thing is once we've once we've harvested that we want to protect the the regrowth, so look after those plants. So, so I think back fencing is pretty important. We're going to try and stimulate some uh, some trampling by increasing the stocking density, and we we we've been doing that this year much better than last year because we've been um, we've been doing multiple breaks through the through the um, grazing period, and uh, and then that should allow us to lift the residual gradually year on year, so that we we can leave more in the field. Um, w and and then stimulate new growth coming through that we're protecting the soil but we'll still keep the quality in the in the pasture so that we're not going to be uh, affecting the affecting the yield with our um with our yeah for our milking cows um so w it was great having um the the innovative farmers uh, sort of support to set up the project we've had um we've had sort of specialist researchers come in and help set the set the project up and i think everyone has been able to choose fields where we've got a, a proper case controlled study so we're um we we took on a new farm uh reseeded everything they were big big fields so the my trial paddock was an 18 hectare field and we reseeded it and we we've split it up into three paddocks so we've got three um six hectare paddocks that are next door to each other we've got one is the one is the um the control and then one is the grazing uh, the tall grass grazing uh, uh, field we we're going to take baseline measurements which happened um, sort of nearly 12 months into the pro project after we discussed that and then we're going to come back to that in year five I think is what we've, we've settled on um, <coughs> so we're going to have a four-year gap between um, our our initial baseline figures we're looking at grass growth that we're all recording chemical, biological, and physical um, properties of the soil, which Farm Carbon Toolkit uh, are doing the sampling for. And uh, interestingly, I think the, the bacterial to fungal ratios is something that we're measuring. It's not typically done in soil analysis, but uh, potentially that's the key. Um, to, you know, quite, quite interested to see what those results turn up with our tall grass grazing. Um, so uh, rather than talking anymore um, <laughs> I just want to show you uh, show you a, um, a video of a, of basically what we're doing um, on on the farm and again I was I was uh, I was taking the video and um, Matt was doing all the hard work so you can <laughs> see him here I think if I press that so we've got 250 cows here these are autumn carvers this was at the end of April um, the 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 break that they've just come off of they they came into after morning milking and Matt's picked up the fence here at nine o'clock in the morning and so you can see they've come in after milking and they've harvested a good chunk of of um, decent quality ryegrass white clover um, but they've also trampled and laid on quite a bit of it I'm not a very good navigator uh, so I hope you don't get seasick um, <coughs> and you can see how just the act of picking up the fence is stimulating trampling and one of the key things I think we can do relatively simply is to increase the stocking density so we've rather than giving these 250 cows a one point uh, I think it's a one hectare break it here for their day grazing we've given them three breaks in that one hectare so effectively we've tripled the stocking rate on that on that grass and there's there's definitely some you know some extra work involved in that 
but we're um, we're keen to do that. You know, this is six hectares out of a 130 hectare platform. You can see here I've sort of scared them a little bit with a with a drone. It got too close, stimulated a bit of extra trampling, um, <laughs> and um, I was a bit concerned that Matt was going to get run over. But uh, so, <laughs> but you can see see there. I think the drone gives a really good um, sort of view of what's happening and what we're doing. Um, in a minute, we'll go to the other end of the field, and you'll see the control, the control paddock, which was grazed just before. So, sort of coming up to the electric fence there, and you can see that's that's more typical of the grazing that we would be doing across the rest of the platform. So, so grazing that down to to a hundred and yeah, fifteen hundred um, level, and so we, yeah, it feel initially feels feels quite wasteful, um, but. We're now two months further on. Um, we've grazed the the tall grass grazing field. Uh, we, we the the, cur the cows are currently in there again today, and that is the the second grazing after this video was taken. Whereas the control field um, has has started to lag behind when it's when it's drier. That we we're seeing that the mo the mob grazing field um, is coming back. More quickly, we've got we've got grass, you know, returning to a grazable level uh, more rapidly. We're still trying to give it that 30-day rest rest period, but I think you can see there, you know, the amount of trampling just just within within two minutes um, of the cows going in there by bu putting that extra fence up. That's been um, pretty good. So that's that, and then this was what it looked like on the ground. The other thing I think is important is to protect the regrowth. So I just wanted to show some pictures. This was the next grazing on, so you can see it's starting to get drier. But in the in the middle of the um, uh, in the picture there, you can see where we've put the back fence up at the front of the f the, the field, and then that that regrowth is really coming on. And that the um, on that screen there, you can see the corner where the cows were walking down a channel, then coming around the corner. And just just the either side of that um, fence, you, there's 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 a lot more grass there that, that we've protected to stop them stop them grazing. Um, yeah, I'll skip over that I think because I've probably taken up my time. But yeah, happy to take some questions um, later on. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Kate, for the introduction. Um, just to reiterate. Uh, we farm in North Yorkshire. Um, we're uh, 300 acres, mixed farm. Um, we're tenants. We took the tenancy on six years ago. Um, so uh, we, we took on a, a plough-based system, and we were very keen to move to a direct drilling system and, and change um, the level of inputs that we had. We're approximately um, a third arable, a third grass, and a third environmental. Oh, let's go back. Long and linear, you can sort of get a, a feel there for uh, what sort of options we have. We're still in an existing um, ELS, HLS scheme. We're considering moving into mid-tier and um, picking up SFI as well. But at the moment, we're, we're 11 years into um, a, a, an HLS agreement. So we've got a wide range of, of different options um, on the environmental side, from things like arable plant plots through to uh, overwind stubbles, extended overwind stubbles. Um, pollen nectar mixes, wild bird mixes, got an awful lot going on, it sort of picture illustrates a little bit. Um, our strategy really is to try and integrate those three different enterprises, the arable, the grass and the environmental. We're looking at a low cost system, low input, um, very environmentally sound. Uh, we also want to try and make ourselves available to um, uh, other environmental income that might come in, although we're, we're finding it quite difficult to access some of it as, as tenant farmers. Um, we're trying to maximise our diversified income. We have got a holiday cottage on the farm. We've got a, a very little used um, fishing lake that we have other plans for. Uh, we're also building up courses around sort of environmental management um, and countryside skills. So we're starting to do hedge lane courses, charcoal burning, botany courses, um, other species identification courses and, and building up some diversified income that way as well. We've got 150 breeding um, New Zealand Romney ewes. Um, at the moment, we're sending most of the lambs as store lambs. But since we introduced a herbal lay about two years ago, we're finding that we're able to fatten a bit more and we're sending those direct to consumers and using a local butcher and getting really, really positive feedback on the quality of, uh, quality of the meat. 
Um, the sheep are, are, are tools for us, so they're tools to help us in all sorts of uh, different different ways. Um, we have introduced herbal lays as a, as a, a two to three year break crop, um, which we you know as I say we're qu quite new into the into the, the growing herbal lays, so we're we're working out how we're going to, to manage it best. So we, we sort of run a, a mixed grazing system at the moment with some st set stocking around lambing time uh, and a bit of rotational grazing and some tall grass grazing as well. So this is the herbal lay um, last year. So you can see what they've grazed and then they've gone into the next compartment and the sheep are actually in there. It's just, it's, it's so tall, you can't actually see the sheep. So uh, we manage that on sort of running um, a number of compartments. Uh, the other picture is how it looked um, a few weeks ago. Uh, and our plan was very much, uh, we, we put in a bespoke mix, so we wanted um, certain species, so chicory and birdsfoot trefoil for the anthel mintic properties, um, plantain, um, lots of deep rooting plants to, to try and improve soil health in that field, and then we'll, we'll move that option around the farm. Um, and then our plan is to end up with a, with a, a clover understory and to direct drill into that as a, as a, as a living mulch, so we'll, um, we'll be watching how that goes. As I say, the sheep are very much a tool, so uh, we use them this year to graze um, graze wheat in February to reduce our, our fertiliser and fungicide use. Um, we use them uh, in a, a sort of very timely and efficient fashion on um, things like uh, an arable reversion field. So when we moved to the farm, um, it, it was five years into a scheme, so it had, uh, and, and the arable reversion field was just meadow brome, nothing else in there at all. And simply bringing sheep and um, back onto the farm has meant that we've we've already made massive leaps in in the number of species that we've got, um, particularly on that arable reversion field. We've seen a huge change, and uh, this photo was taken um, probably uh, about three weeks ago. But um, it's a, an absolute palette of colour now, uh, and amazing to see the the number of invertebrates it it um, it supports. So we, we've definitely find found bringing sheep back into into the farm and onto into the rotation has made a, a huge difference. Um, you know, we can see how many extra bats we've got because of the, the bug numbers that are around. Um, moving on to, to the, the wheat. We're growing uh, winter wheat. Uh, I'd say we've introduced um, a herbal lane, a, a sort of two, two to three year break crop. Um, we, uh, we're early in direct drillers. We've got very heavy land, so uh, we try and, um, try and get drilled in, in September. We haven't used insecticides um, or slug pellets since we've been on the farm. Um, we tend to increase seed rates uh, in high-risk areas. Um, we've seen a lot more insects uh, on the farm, on, uh, on the ground, uh, over the six years. Um, much great improvements in, in the number of soil invertebrates and uh, beetles scurrying around and spiders, so that's been really encouraging. Uh, we've been able to reduce um, nitrogen use, so we're, we're sort of 50% bag and 50% foliar feed, and we try and add in carbon to the applications where we can. Um, we were really pleased to be able to get involved with uh, an Innovative Farmers Field Lab project. Um, ours was based around uh, looking at flower-rich margins. We've, we're very fortunate to have some amazing um, flower-rich uh, margins, so all sort of classic things that you'd expect to see. Um, this is taken uh, this week, so a really good range, wild carrot and um, bed straws and goat's beard. Uh, what else have we got in there? Meadow, Cranesville and some mallow, uh, yarrow. So we've got a, a huge range, and I think um, there's been focus very much about how beneficial that is for pollinators, but we were keen to see if it had if they had other impacts, um, particularly around um, crop pests and the beneficial insects that might predate on crop pests. So when the opportunity came up to get involved in the field lab project, which is supported by the AHDB as well, um, we were really keen to be involved to see whether the number of insects that we had has impacted um, our ability to to take uh, insecticide use out of uh, off the farm. Um, so as you can see, it's a f everything on the farm is a family affair, whether that's lambing or collecting samples. Um, everybody's involved in everything. Uh, in this particular field lab project, there were seven, seven farmers involved. And we set um, in May, and, uh, and it was repeated in, in June, we set out um, some traps, pitfall traps, as you can see, and sticky traps. So they were set 10, 25, and 50 metres from the flowering margins. Um, and those results were then uh, collected and sent to ADAS um, for um, further analysis. We're expecting the report um, shortly, 
probably in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you want to know a bit more about the project, then uh, there is a video um, available, a film was made, and that's available on the uh, Innovative Farmers um, website. Uh, but the results should be uh, um, available soon. But uh, sort, of as, as sort of some headlines that we've taken out of it already are that aphid numbers were lower on the fields that had um, flower margins, or should, should have said is we had a control field as well. Each farmer had a control field where there was no flowering margin and then a field where there was a flowering margin. And we, we were seeing that the aphid numbers were lower in the fields that had um, flower margins and beetle numbers were higher. So I think we've seen some encouraging results and I hope that will, I think really what we need to do is build on that, um, take it forward, increase the sample size, look at it perhaps in a little bit more detail, analyse a bit more the actual species that, that, um, that were found I think there's an uh, opportunity to do a lot more around that and, and hopefully we can start to put even more science behind it and give farmers the, um, the confidence to, to reduce um, insecticide use on farm. Uh, we've got lots of interesting features on, on the farm uh, and we try and make use of those to, to draw in funding or to maximise uh, income where we can. We've got um, uh, a landslide on the farm. It's the most studied landslide in the world, which seems pretty extraordinary for a, a relatively small field in North Yorkshire. Um, but actually, that does bring in an income. You know, we can't use the field for an awful lot else, but um, the British Geology Survey have um, equipment on that, that hill, so we're actually getting an income from them um, for, for al allowing them to undertake research and, and things on that, on that hill. We've put in a turtle dove plot. Um, we have had turtle doves in the area, so we, we were able to get some funding to support that through uh, the Hawardian Hills area of Outstanding Natural Beauty and the North York Moors National Park, which, which covers the cost of putting that in. So we've done that on the area that wasn't uh, we weren't um, able to use for an awful lot else. Uh, we, we try and use different uh, management on, on the margin so we can see what works best. So on some of them, we're, uh, we're cutting them. We can't remove the cutting, so obviously those, those are going back on as, as mulch. So... We also have tried grazing the margins, and we, we feel that, that that's really very effective. And some we've left uh, we've left long, so we're trying different different ways of of managing um, the flower margins. We've got really good hedges, so we support huge numbers of farmland birds. And uh, what we're pleased to see in the six years that we've been there is that the number of different species we have has increased, but also the range of species, such as. Um, um, we've got marbled white butterflies and, and their range has, has, has increased across the whole farm rather than just being in one place, which is where they were um, when we, we moved to the farm. Uh, we also, have, uh, we're, we also f have a reputation on the farm for rare arable plants. I mean, one is so rare it's actually listed in the ID books as, as being extinct, and I, I can track back where it probably came from, but we have really strong populations of arable plants which are which are a very threatened um, group of plants at the moment. So the, the picture in the middle at the bottom is um, corn buttercup, uh, which is an amazing plant, has little seeds like stickle breaks that stick together. So we're keen to support those. And, and ironically, we're in a, a direct drilling system, but we have to disturb the ground on the arable plant plots uh, because the plants rely on the disturbance for, for germination. So really, we're, we're trying uh, to take advantage of opportunities that come up. We're trialling different methods of, of, of achieving our, our end goal. And uh, I think in six years, we've, we've made um, some significant moves forward and, and we've, we're very pleased with how things are going at the moment. Thank you very much. Amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm sure you've got lots of questions for Francis and for, um, for Dan, but if you can hold on and we'll hear from David and then we'll have some time after that. So David, thank you very much. Do you mind if I stand up? I'm just Go for it. Is this working? Right. Morning, everybody. Um, right, so um, contrary to what Kate said, we actually make uh, cow's milk cheese. Did but I say uh, sheep? You said I goat, <laughs> but that's fine. Um, that's fine. So we farm in <laughs> southwest Leicestershire near to Market Bosworth, um, and I farm in partnership with my wife and, uh, and son, William. That photograph shows us it's a few years ago now. We both have less hair than that now. Um, so... Um, Probably partly due to re it's not really re we started regenerative farming, but it's we've lost hair in the process somewhere. Um, and we actually started to just give you a bit of a background. Uh, we we farmed 380 acres, 140 dairy cows, 150 Romney sheep, um, and we paddock grazed the, the dairy cows. We have five acre paddocks which we split into one, two, three, or four, um, and we have about 25 hectares that's on uh, that's permanent pasture, and about. Uh, 16 years ago, I think it was, I listened to Ben Mead, who makes, uh, whose family make Yarg cheese, and he inspired me to stop using chemical fertiliser 
where the cows graze um, and try and get more different species of plants uh, into our pastures. So uh, at, at that point I stopped using chemical. I, I went home and I looked at the fields where the cows were grazing and I let them into a fresh field and they, we were always very careful not to put any fertiliser anywhere near the hedge because we were too tight and we wanted to make sure it didn't go in the hedge. So we had a lot more clover around the edges of the fields. And I, and I let these cows, th the cows into a field and they went all the way around the edge and ate all the, all the grass and clover from around the outside and then went to the middle. And I thought there really is something in this. It's, it, 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 this is important. So we stopped using chemical fertiliser. We allowed, we're brilliant at growing dandelions uh, and cows love dandelions as you don't have, if you don't have too many in your pastures it, 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 they, they'll graze them and milk well on them um, and they're good for the cows. So it was a, that was the beginning of our regenerative journey, but I didn't call it regenerative, I just called it using less fertiliser or no fertiliser. Uh, and then about three or four years ago, I didn't even know what regenerative was at that point, three or four years ago some of our customers started talking about regenerative farming and I thought I need to look this up, I need to understand this a bit more. And when I looked into it I just thought this, this is for us, we're farming 380 acres, 140 to 50 milking cows, 150 sheep. If, if we can't make it work, then probably nobody can. We, we ought to give it a go. We are, our soil type is a uh, marl clay loam. Um, so it's good grassland soil. Uh, it grows good crops of wheat if you get it right. Um, so we then set about changing over and we're, we're sort of partway down the journey. We're now growing herbal lays and that sort of thing and, and, and more about that in a little while. But about so about 70% of the milk we produce is made into cheese. Um, so we, we tend to look at the whole, f the, the whole business very holistically um, and, and what we grow on the farm and, gr and the, what the cows graze becomes much more important when you become a cheesemaker. You're concentrating that, that uh, milk down to about 11% of its, uh, its original state. So it really does matter what the cows graze. And what we're trying to do is by, um, by having more diversity in the cows' ration Hopefully that will um, we get more diversity in flavour in the milk and therefore in the cheese. So, um, so that's that's a lot of the thinking behind what we're doing. Um, that was a lovely film of the Leicestershire countryside. We've got a bit of a problem with the tech. I think that's my fault, not anybody else's. Um, but if you can imagine the Leicestershire countryside <laughs> and the cows, um, and it showed some of the paddocks and the, and the sort of the differences in the grazing um, as we go around the paddocks um, and. Just to put you in to where we are uh, in the country, King Richard III actually died about a kilometre away from the field. Contrary to popular belief, he did not d die in a car park in Leicester. Um, he died somewhere near to us. So we're right on the edge of the English Heritage Battlefield site for uh, the Battle of Bosworth. So sorry about that. Um, so I've, be, I've been coming to Ground Cell. This is the third year now. We c I came last year and I went onto a stand and met uh, Tara. Where is Tara? here from pastoral hello Tara uh, and um, and I joined up to this uh, th th this project which is to uh, map a measure with a satellite the amount of biomass that, uh, and leaf cover there is on, on the fields um, I don't know what inspired me to do it I just thought this this looks like a good idea um, you know th let's give it a go I wanted to get involved so um, they started um, measuring our, our, our biomass and this is and, and they've taken 10 fields uh, and they got all the data collected all the data they needed to do it so um, at, at is it sort of are we on two weeks now or a month it varies a bit we get a we get by email we get these these maps come through to us and which measures the biomass um, so and, and it gives you the date uh, the kilograms of dry matter per hectare and the difference from the time before. Um, so that just shows you, and if I just flick through, it shows you the darker green it is, the more biomass there is. So um, I've never used a plate meter. I'm sort of bottom of the class, really. Um, I think there's much people that um, have a much better idea and technical way of measuring the grass. I'm a bit old-fashioned. I walk around the farm, have a look, see how much there is, see how far up my well is it is, and that's how I manage our feeding wedge. Um, I'm sure if I used a, a, a plate meter, I'd be better. Um, 
but so, so some, some of the farmers that are uh, involved with this are using plate meters, so they're able to give information back to Tara about what the actual yield there is on the field. Um, but what, um, sorry, let's just move that on again. So if I just take that back again, if you look the field number seven, uh, which is called Ready Moor, that's very close to where King Richard III died. Um, that was taken on uh, the 3rd of the 5th, and on about the 17th of the 5th, we cut our silage, and you can see the difference there. It's gone a much paler colour because we took, took the silage off. That's a field of uh, herbal lay, which is an arable rotation, so that'll be down for three years. Um, so it's all useful stuff. Maybe in the future, um, people that, that use plate meters will be able to use this, this instead. And on a larger farm, I think it would supply a, a lot more information a, a lot quicker to people. That's what that field looks nice. It looks like now. My children are grown up, so I've used a spaniel for for <laughs> for scale. Um, they don't want to come walking with me anymore. Um, so that that's the herbal lay, and and that's I don't know I'd how much um, dry matter do you think is on that, Dan? You're the expert with that kind of thing. So that's the regrowth, right? So that's so that's it. This is in its second year, um, and um, we put on that field about 200 kilos per hectare of 27N35S, and then it hasn't had anything else. Uh, that's the only bug fertilizer it's had. Uh, we can't quite get past that point where we don't put any on at all. So that went on in early March, um, and then we took the, took the first cut off. We'd have a big first cut off it, uh, and then we put some slurry on it. Um, and, and that's the, the regrowth since then. So that was taken two days ago. Um, so we're quite pleased with that. that. That looks good. We had some rain this year, which is um, be much better than last year. So we're in a significantly better position. Uh, that's Tara measuring the biomass. So every now and then, Tara's been two or three times and come and actually measured the biomass in an area to check that it, it fits with what the satellites are telling them. Um, and and that, um, that's Tara doing that. We also get these, um, uh, these uh, leaf area index maps. And again, these are a bit more pretty because they give you a bit more of a, uh, it's on a per field basis. And that, that, so that field there, the big picture was taken on the 23rd of, 23rd of February. And you can see the, the one in the top uh, right corner that's what, what it looked like on the 31st of January. The spot in the middle, that's a pit hole, that is, uh, a pond that's fenced round. So if I just move that on, that's what it looked like on the 4th of April. And then that's after silaging. The piece at the top corner, we grazed that because we needed a bit, it, was, it was drying up, we needed a bit extra grass for some um, in calf heifers. So that's why that looks different. Um, and that's what it looked like on the 10th of June. So the area, again, you can see the bit that was grazed now has less grass because we'd grazed it off, less, less leaf area. Uh, and the rest of it, we put dirty water on it, which is basically any brown water, including whey from the cheese making, uh, parlor washings, everything like that goes into that. And we used that on the, on that, the rest of the, the area which we silaged. Um, so that, um, that's, that's grown and, and improved much better crop again. Um, so those 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 work well. They they they, I think they tell you quite a lot. Applications. When I when I was first when Dan first said would I talk at this, I thought I said yes, and then I thought, hmm, I don't know how I'm actually going to apply this information that I've been given yet. I, it's um it's quite it's it's in its early stages, uh, so I had to really sit down and think about how it was how it was going to be used. Um, and the obvious application is for grazing uh, and conservation lay planning and management. So, um, you know, it may, people that use plate meters might be able to spend less time by using this information. You know, for me, on, on the size of our farm, I like to walk about it anyway. So maybe that's not so, such a significant um, uh, th thing to have, but, but maybe I'm just a bit old fashioned and once I get used to it, I'll use it more than what I think. Um, it could definitely help to predict costly forage shortages. And Tara's talking about applying weather patterns to um, to the matrix, just and to be able to give people more of an idea. If I could 
prevent what happened to us last year. I can't stop it being so dry as it was last year, but maybe by ha by the ha the use of some of this information, I would have taken more. I could have uh, I could have possibly taken more whole crop, and it would have cost us a lot less last year. I think I spent about well, I d I've not added it up properly, but an, a an extra sixty thousand pounds in the winter because it was so dry last summer. Maybe if I'd have foraged more whole crop by the help of some of this information, I could have saved myself some money. Um, other applications, yield mapping, mapping uh, targeting inputs and uh, identifying poor patches in fields. I think if you kept overlaying some of these pictures of the, of the leaf area, we might find that there's areas in fields that are always poor and maybe they need identifying and maybe they need something else, maybe maybe they need a bit of um, gypsum pudding on the field or whatever. We're very high mag in our area, so we, we risk uh, lock-up um, with phosphorus and possibly calcium. So um, it could identify areas in fields that need test more testing. It could I'd also identify areas which were be are better in fields. Um, other applications, possibly use of uh, on a national scale, um, in countries where, where drought is, is, is a, 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 an annual problem, it's, ju it's more information, isn't it? And information is king. Um, another one I thought of while I was sort of racking my brain was maybe wildfire prevention and management. You know, if you can understand how much biomass is in an area, you could perhaps understand how to manage a wildfire and, and prevent wildfires actually happening. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much for listening. and. Um, Questions, welcome. Thank you very much, David. And yeah, no, thank you to all of you. I mean, I think you can see from what's been talked about this morning, well, both incredibly interesting systems that people are running and doing all sorts of other things other than just the bits of trial work that they've been sharing and, and you know, huge amounts of learning going on on an everyday basis. Um, but the, you know, the IF trials just allow that bit of extra input, that little bit extra thought and science um, behind some of the, the acti activities that people are doing. So um, anyway, we've got about 15 minutes left for questions. So any questions for our three farmers? Um, yeah, gentleman in the... Suzanne. Suzanne, do you have any problems with weeds at weeds? We have weeds, yep. Um, we, the, the, the field that we're doing the trial on um, was reseeded in, in 2020, um, in the spring 2020. Uh, so it's relatively new lay um, and is a, is a pretty clean field. We would certainly see uh, docks coming up and going to seed um, uh, last... Uh, so we we have done some uh, w like across the rest of the farm. We would typically go and, and and top fields that had a problem trying to catch them before they they go to seed. Um, we've we've been in and topped the the the, the, the trial field as well, um, just from purely from a sort of a weed management point of view. I think I can add to that. Um, I think since we stopped using fertilizer a good time ago now, after a while the cows are more likely to eat docks that are not fed with fertilizer. Uh, and we'd, we'd seen that, actually. Yeah, they, they tuck into them. Yeah. yeah. Um, great. Oh, the lady there and then the lady at the front. Um, uh, thank you. I'd just like to ask Dan, your mob grazing is very impressive. I didn't see a water trough. D is that is that easy to for you? Got that sorted? Yeah. So we've got water troughs at the front of those fields, um, and uh, the picture of the um, the back fences that I showed. We we created laneways um, so that they would come up up to the front of the field um, to access the water trough, and that's potentially why there was there was more traffic on on that yeah. that sort of area that I that so I showed. So on a hot day, look like some of those we've had in the past, does does it ever become a problem when you haven't got enough water? Or your pressure is good enough. Uh, we've we've got a good system. Um, yeah. We we have also actually um, invested in a an old tanker, so we've got a um, fifteen thousand gallon. Um, tanker with troughs on it that we can just run a run a pipe over ground from the the trough at the front of the field 
which helps us. We, we use it quite a lot when we're bell grazing in the winter so that we can keep moving a backing fence, keep, keep moving cattle along. And then in the summer, it gives us extra capacity. And if we're trying to back graze cows off of the field, we can quite you know, relatively simply put that in the field, park it up. Um, it's an extra reservoir there when they're drinking in, in high demand and they've got extra access. So. Do you do bricks readings at all to kind of monitor your uh, photosynthesis and things? We don't know. No, it's not something we've done either. But it, I think it would be, you know, interesting to to do. Yeah. Thank you all. Great presentations. Um, I just, w for everyone, um, wondered how you keep your team involved and open-minded about trial work. Well, <coughs> we are the team. Uh, we don't have anybody else. It's uh, my husband, me, and uh, our two girls. So, um, yeah, everybody's on board. Uh, what has been interesting is the we have a lot of public rights away across the farm, so we're on a, we're on a crossroads. And it's really interesting how the public have become increasingly engaged and they've responded to changes they've seen on the farm I in the time we've been there. And that's raised lots of questions, particularly around the direct drilling, because it, 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 you know, look, it does look different. Um, so it's been a really good way to engage the wider community. I, I've got a slightly bigger team. I've got um, quite a good group of, of, of young, youngish people um, working. And my... I guess my driver to get involved with this, I said, um, is trying to cope with a low rainfall field. And it's very much a financial um, sort of driver trying to produce more forage. And um, uh, so we run two separate herds. We've got two herds and they do the grass monitoring on those farms. And, you know, and then I go through it with them and we, we talk about it. And so it's just it's just involving them in the higher level, the bigger picture. And um, and like I say, m you know, Matt's done actually all the legwork without you know without um, without him uh, doing doing the fences. I mean, I I probably would have gone and done them, but it's been very easy for me, and I feel a bit of a fraud sitting up here because he's done all the legwork. For for us, it's it's Tara that's doing all the all the all the work really at the moment. So uh, at some point, it's something we could possibly share with the staff. Up to now, we haven't. Um, it's hard enough just to keep somebody milking the cows. I've had to take it over myself again at the moment, <laughs> you know, what the labour situation is like. But it would be lovely to, you to, uh, to have something like that which you could share with whoever was moving the electric fence on a daily basis, that kind of thing. Oh, um, the gentleman at the back and then the lady there. Oh, hello, thanks. Uh, yeah, great presentations. George Hosford, farmer from Dorset, uh, a neighbour of Dan's, um, but I'm not going to embarrass him. Um, for those of you who are integrating your uh, stock with your arable, have you got issues with uh, growing, say, wheat after a one of your lays? Because w we've had terrible trouble with that with leather jackets, for example. Have you got any tips? Um, no, not... Uh, um W to, be, to be honest, we've only we, on we only have 140 acres of arable. We tend to grow wheat after beans. Um, when we remove th those uh, herbal lays, yes, there is a question mark of what the best way to do it is going to be. Um, we don't really suffer with leather jackets too much. We have a very useful mob of rooks um, that do very good work for us. Um, most of the time, sometimes they're nicking seed and then we hate them. Um, so, I yes, it's something that we may have to tackle. Leather jackets are not a massive problem for us. And I do think the rooks probably take a lot of them out. Time, time will tell. I'll get back to you with that. And when, we in, when we remove that, how we're going to remove it is, is, is a problem. We do, we do have problems removing. We've, we've only got 12 acres left of our what we com used conventionally, which is uh, perennial ryegrass and white clover. Uh, and yes, we have had a bit, we've removed that this spring and, and we've we ended up having to spray it twice with glyphosate to get rid of it, which is not ideal in my view and, and it doesn't sit well, but um, 
uh, we haven't had a problem with leather jackets. Thank you. This will be the first year that we're following our herbal with wheat, so um, we'll wait and see. Thank you very much. Really interesting presentations. I'm Judy Carroll Hammond from the CLA. I have a question for Dan um, about tall grazing. It looks like it might be more labor intensive than other methods. Have you done the math? Does it pay for itself? Thank you. Yeah, um, that's d definitely a question I was asking myself last year. Um, like I say, the first year, I think we got it wrong and it cost us because we lost milk when we grazed it. Uh, we were you know, grazing it with milk and cows is actually on the autumn calving um, block and so for for the dry period in the summer um, we had we had dry cows grazing it and we we used it effectively as a as a standing hay um, which is what we do for our dry cows anyway and which is partly why I got interested in it uh, because it's um, we, we we'd done that for a couple of years and seen the benefits that that standing hay did um, had on some particularly poor shallow ground that um that we we basically couldn't get a cut of silage off to co to coincide with our first or second cut uh, so there was the first grazing we had was a standing hay for our dry cows and then two three years on um that field's actually performing really well so sorry i'm not answering your question but um there's we've we've managed to integrate it into how we would normally manage the field so there isn't any extra labor there We've we've lost money when we've got it wrong by grazing um, the the over mature um, grass with with milking cows. There's definitely a labour cost to it. We, we you could see the fields are, are fairly well set up, and I think having that electric fencing, it, it, the, there's a cost to it. But it the, the video was two two minutes long. Um, it took you know so there were three f fences in the field. It would take just about as long to to set it back up again. So it's effectively four minutes per fence in that field. It's not it's not a huge amount of time um, to 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 do it, and I think it's a long term it's a long term game. If we can get that um, increase rapid increase in soil carbon organic matter, and we can kickstart the biology, and we can start um, you know growing more grass, it's going to rapidly outweigh the uh, outweigh the cost of doing it. Um, great. Uh, the lady in the blue and then the gentleman behind, and then we probably might have to call it a day. Thanks very much for your talks. I'm Pritha Langford from Newcastle University, and I was wondering if you have any um, health and welfare advantages or disadvantages from your systems that you've seen in the last few years? One thing I've noticed um, when it's been hot recently is the advantage of um, longer grass for the sheep, so that they haven't got a lot of shade in, in the field that happens to be in herbal lay this year. But actually I'm, I'm much more comfortable with the fact that they're in long grass and the ground is remaining cooler. So I think that's, that's another advantage of, of that system. We don't have anything measurable to, to say, but um, I think you, c you, can't, you can't deny that feeding cattle more different species of plants has got to be good for them. Uh, and what's good for the cow is good for its milk, and what's good for its milk is good for cheese. That's where I'm, I'm coming from. So, yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm pleased with the cows look well. I'm pleased with that. We get very few foot problems um, because we have a loose house system anyway, so that's not really an issue. Uh, we're doing something quite different. I think uh, there's quite a lot of dairy farmers are getting onto it now. Instead of if we get it, if we we're more likely to get m problems with mastitis because we're loose house. We now we don't use antibiotics to treat those cows anymore. Uh, there's a company called AHV, which is Animal Health Visions. Uh, they can supply you with boluses, which are plant-based, and we use. If a cow gets mastitis, we treat it with uh, these boluses, um, which uh, I think is brilliant. Um, we've vastly re we hardly use any antibiotics at all now. We uh, we would um, similar haven't really got anything measurable but um, anecdotally uh, on the tall grass grazing uh, moving and uh, rapidly and frequently and back fencing I feel has a has a benefit from flies and uh, you know re removing them from the breeding ground and um, and then not not making them eat right down to the to the floor um, in theory should be 
beneficial for from a worm, worm burden point of view. Um, we're you know, we're doing that with some young stock as well, which is probably where we'd see more of a, a benefit because we, you, parasites, gut parasites, aren't really an issue for the adult milking cows. Um, and then again, not part of the trial, but the herbal grazing, as as you said, you know, I think it's fairly well documented that the the chicory and the the, the plantain and the uh, you know other bits truffles potentially will have um, an anthelmintic uh, benefit for those animals. Yeah. Um, I think just the gentleman with glasses. Um, are you establishing uh, herbal lays by direct drilling into pasture and do you have any tips on how best to make that work? Uh, we, uh, we have a grass rake um, uh, with, a, with, a, with a cedar on it. So um, we're es we're establishing them with that, and it and it works very well. We're pleased with it. Um, and we've we've put so we put those herbal lays on our w worst weediest patches, where we have had black grass. Um, so in the three years that we've now um, been direct drilling, we've we've vastly reduced the black uh, any black black grass on the farm. And I'm saying that nervously because it can suddenly come back, can't it? But we've really We've really hammered it by direct drilling, growing spring crops, growing cover crops for the sheep. Um, everywhere. So we, of, of the 140 acres of arable, we normally have about 60 acres of spring barley and spring barley and peas we've got this year for whole crop. Um, and it definitely helps. We are seeing, and this is, this is not really answering your question, but anyway, um, we, we <laughs> use a grass harrow. We are seeing an increase in the amount of brome um, so we might have to find ways of, of tackling that. Um, my son, as I said, drives all this and he's tried to instill in me not to do work any ground at all. He's away on holiday and we've just, after uh, harvesting triticale and vetch whole crop, we've ju yesterday sowed some, um, uh, some cover crop for the sheep, which had a mixture of rye and phacelia and all sorts of things in it. Uh, and I did get a carrier and we... <laughs> hired it off my father-in-law we did carry the ground because it was a bit hard on the top so when he comes home he'll curse me but um <laughs> i think there's certain times i think you can i don't want it to become a religion i think sometimes you've just got to work the ground it was very we had about 10 mil of tilth and then there was a, a bit of a cap which probably caused by the sheep um um and any i just felt it needed working Sorry, we've got a minute to go. Dan, have you got any? I was just gonna d in answer to that, um, w I've tried to direct drill a herbal overseeding mix into an established um, ryegrass and clover lay. Um, that was a pretty much a failure. Um, it, it didn't see anything in the first year. Actually, in the second year that we saw the herbs coming through, but uh, compared to a uh, we're on an organic system, so we we struggle to get you know get the grass out. Um, we we would get much better results with a plough and a, and a full cultivation um, in terms of establishing that. And to try and reduce the amount of ground turnover, I've um, put more um, typical traditional species of grass in there, so Timothy, Fescue and Coxfoot, uh, forming a much higher um, component in that seed mixture so that when the herbs disappear, which I expect they, they will do, and we're seeing now sort of three, four years in, then we're left with a, a more sustainable, longer um, lasting grass population. That's that's sort of how we're trying to do it. Sorry, I didn't answer the question properly. We carry it, where we're gonna sow grass, we carry it, so which is a set of discs, then we harrow it in with the, with the grass harrow, and then we flat roll. And it works well, we're pleased with it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to the three of you. And just to say, if um, yeah, if anyone's got any trials or anything they want to discuss with the Innovative Farmers team, do come to the Soil Association tent. If you want to talk more about pastoral, um, come and find Tara um, in the pastoral um, stand in, um, we're next door in one of the, um, the larger tents. And um, also just shout out for the agroforestry show that the Soil Association and Woodland Trust are hosting in September in Wiltshire. Please do come along, um, and book your ticket and you get 10% uh, off if you've uh, been at Groundswell. So yeah, do come along and see us there. But thank you ever so much for joining and thanks again to our speakers. <laughs>